Hey everyone, we know how hard it can be to keep up with the latest news in Israel, so if you haven't had the time to stay on top of what's what in the Holy Land with ILTV, have no worries. It's time for our new show this week in Israel where we'll give you the scoop on everything you need to know about the last seven days right from Tel Aviv. I'm Natasha Kirchuk here to keep you informed. This morning, a Palestinian man pulled out a pistol and opened fire on a group of Israeli border police officers at a checkpoint in the West Bank, just south of Jerusalem. No officers were reported injured at the time, uh, and the suspect was captured and arrested after police gave chase. This incident mirrors a similar event earlier last week, when Palestinian suspects allegedly opened fire on an Israeli car driving throughout the West Bank. The Sheen Beit has just announced that they've actually arrested two suspects believed to be behind the terror attempt, though. Israeli security teams tracked them down to a Ramallah suburb, and during questioning, the suspects apparently, quote, implicated themselves in the incident. Though tensions between Israel and the Palestinians have somewhat calmed following the bloody climax of the Hamas-sponsored March of Return rallies in Gaza, we're seeing more and more of that unrest now in the West Bank. Security teams are still dealing with arson attempts along the Gaza border, however. Palestinians have increasingly begun flying homemade firebombs over the border using homemade kites. Combine that with the country's dry summer heat, and what you have is a very deadly scenario for brush fires. The Palestinians have just ramped up their bid for official recognition of the state of Palestine in a major way. They've just been cordially accepted to two UN agencies, as well as the world's foremost chemical watchdog agency, the Chemical Weapons Convention. Israel has long campaigned against memberships like these, and the United States now may even cut its funding to the United Nations to punish those agencies that gave the PA the go-ahead. U.S. law already includes a precedent for this. American policy has typically stated that membership to the Palestinians in international organizations is counterproductive to the peace process, and in some cases premature. Still, this is a major win for the Palestinians in their effort to be seen by the world as their very own independent state. In the past, the Palestinian Authority has held only observer status in the United Nations, and this new membership allows them to vote on matters in two major agencies, the UN's Trade Development Organization and the Industrial Development Agency. But the biggest gain for the Palestinians is probably membership in the Chemical Weapons Convention. This is the world's foremost group that aims to halt the development of nuclear weapons. Nations who sign this treaty are forbidden from stockpiling weapons of mass destruction. Interestingly, Israel is one of only four countries, however, that has not ratified this agreement, along with Egypt, South Sudan, and North Korea. A group of Palestinians from Gaza managed to breach the security fence and enter Israeli territory early this morning. The suspects immediately set fire to an abandoned IDF position nearby, recently used by Israeli snipers during the six-week-long border protests. The group set fire to the empty outpost, then retreated back into the Gaza Strip. As usual, the army holds Hamas responsible for any and all aggression from the enclave. Israeli tanks have just unleashed a barrage of shells on a Hamas observation post in retaliation. Obviously, this is only the latest in a long string of infiltration attempts and aggression by Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, though. This unrest reached its peak last week at the end of the six-week-long March of Return protest sponsored by Hamas. The terror group reportedly offered to cede the violence in exchange for Israel softening its military responses. For that reason, possibly, this past weekend was the calmest in months along the Gaza border. Still, tensions are obviously extremely volatile in the wake of last week's opening of the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem. Soldiers along the border remain on high alert. Tensions along the Gaza border have begun to spread to the West Bank. This morning, an Israeli car was driving outside the Palestinian village of Kafir Ni'ima near Ramallah, where it suddenly came under gunfire in an apparent drive-by shooting. Thankfully, though, the car itself took several bullets. None of the Israeli passengers inside were injured. An IDF manhunt is now underway for the suspects. The security situation in the West Bank is quite different from that in Gaza, made complicated by the fact that Israelis and Palestinians often overlap throughout the region. Though the IDF has seen significant unrest and demonstrations here in the wake of President Trump's decision to move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, security has remained rather tight. Still, this morning's incident is a wake-up call that tensions are still simmering beneath the surface. Last night, the army arrested 11 Palestinian suspects in midnight raids, several of whom are believed to be taking part in terror activities. Despite frozen ties with the PA, security collaboration is perhaps the only place where Israeli and Palestinian authorities continue to cooperate.
Well, guys, it's official. Paraguay has become the second country to follow the United States' example and move its embassy to Jerusalem. President Horacio Cartes arrived in Israel yesterday to oversee today's ceremony. Prime Minister Netanyahu has hailed this as a great day for Israel, a great day for Paraguay, and a great day for our friendship. Once again, uh, we are very happy, Excellency. Uh, the people say in the, the history, if 3,000 years ago was the capital, I think that all what we're doing is putting the history in the right place. Uh, I want to say too that I like and I really appreciate your warmness, your kindness, and especially your French. Paraguay, we feel Israel love you. We love you too. Thank you very much. Well, this is quite a week for Israel. The last seven days have seen three countries spearheaded by the United States relocate their embassies to the Holy City. In most cases, these are merely symbolic gestures, but for Israelis who've always seen Jerusalem as their capital city, it's the realization of something far more valuable. Still, the decision of U.S. President Donald Trump last year to relocate the American embassy to Jerusalem ignited a firestorm of debate. The majority of the world's nations condemn the move, insisting that the fate of Jerusalem should be left between Israel and the Palestinians in peace talks. Trump's decision effectively ended American diplomacy with the Palestinians altogether. Palestinian leadership has demanded that Paraguay, along with the U.S. and Guatemala, all return their embassies to Tel Aviv. But this criticism couldn't dampen the mood for Israelis in Jerusalem this week. Netanyahu and President Cartes enjoyed and or are enjoying a festive day of ceremonies for the opening of today's embassy. Paraguay actually had its embassy in Jerusalem until 2012. Now, the two countries have enjoyed flourishing ties in recent years, and today's party is clearly the icing on the cake. Paraguay helped Jews escape Nazi Germany. We will never forget this. You did this before the Holocaust, during the Holocaust, and after the Holocaust. Now, as if the United States recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital wasn't enough, it looks like the U.S. may now have yet another surprise in store to delight Israelis. Israel's intelligence minister says talks are currently underway with the White House to officially recognize Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights. The Golan region was Syrian territory until Israel conquered it during the Six-Day War in 1967. The Israeli government began moving citizens to the area shortly thereafter and officially annexed the region in 1981. Much like the recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital, pretty much all Israelis already see the Golan as part of Israel. But that's not the case with national law forbids one country from annexing territory from another country conquered during war, which is why practically no countries formally recognize the Golan as part of Israel today. The White House has so far declined to comment to offer this recognition. But according to Intelligence Minister Israel Katz, lateral talks with the Trump administration are already underway to make this happen. Katz even says that the recognition could be formally announced within a few months. Such an announcement, however, would likely reignite shockwaves still sizzling in the wake of Trump's decision to move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. But in this case, the impact and potential consequences would also likely be a national affair. It would be seen as a joint offense by Israel and the United States against both Syria and Iran, as well as potentially Russia. Syria has long sought to reclaim this territory, which stands as a critical buffer for Israel against the Iranian threat on the border. Israel has entered talks with Syria in the past about possibly returning the Golan, but as of today, Prime Minister Netanyahu has promised that the territory will forever remain in Israel's hands. Well, protests have surged against Israel, accusing misconduct in the army's handling of the latest Gaza border rallies. The UN's Human Rights Council has just voted for an official investigation into the death of at least 112 Palestinians shot by the IDF during the last two months. But meanwhile, in Haifa, hundreds of Israelis have protested against the IDF as well, igniting a new domestic controversy. Owl TV's Brett Allen Smith is here with a story. Thanks, Natasha. Well, things turned uh, rather violent in Haifa over the weekend. A huge number of protesters took to the streets in solidarity, they say, with the citizens of Gaza. And Israeli police were dispatched to the scene, and fairly quickly, we saw clashes break out. Now, 21 protesters were arrested on Friday night, but it's the arrest of one man in particular. This is a human rights activist named Jafar Farah that sparked a debate here. And uh, Farah claims that an Israeli police officer intentionally broke his leg after he'd already been arrested. And according to his story, he wasn't even part of the protests at all. He says he was only there trying to bring back his son. 
Now, this incident has already escalated into one of the biggest local headlines. Israel's police department is now under fire for alleged excessive force. Right. Israeli leaders, however, say they were just doing their job. Is there an update yet from the courts here? Yeah, so it looks like the courts have begun to side somewhat with what the protesters are saying. Now, court documents say that at least seven other protesters arrested on Friday had to be taken to the hospital after their arrest for immediate medical care. And for that reason, the judge actually just ruled that all the protesters will be released from jail immediately. An investigation into any alleged brutality and possibly criminal charges may soon be on the way. Now, these protests mirror similar rallies happening all over the world. Uh, in Morocco, more than 10,000 demonstrators right, marched to criticize Israel's handling of the Gaza border clashes. We're seeing something similar in Turkey as well, which is obviously not a surprise. Diplomatic relations with Israel all but broke down last right, week. Will right, the United right. Nations actually vote to investigate the IDF here? Okay, so here's probably what's going to happen. So the Palestinians will probably be able to summon a vote at the Security Council. Now, if that vote were to pass, then yeah, the UN would send an international team to investigate Israel's conduct during those border clashes. The United States, however, has already promised that they would veto any such vote, which means this will all probably end up at the UN's General Assembly, mm -hmm. which unlike the Security Council, doesn't actually have any legally binding power with its resolutions. And this is, if you remember, the same path essentially that things took last year when the UN tried to vote against Trump's decision to move the USMC to Jerusalem. Right, right. Well, Prime Minister Netanyahu has already slammed the United Nations for even suggesting that Israel acted out of line. The army has been pretty clear that these protests were sponsored and organized by Hamas. Many of the casualties from these clashes were, in fact, Hamas operatives. Um, and despite all the outrage, I think Israel feels like the West kind of fell for Hamas's PR game yeah. here. But obviously, we're just going to have to, to wait yeah. and see where this goes. Thanks for joining us, Brett. And this brings us into our next interview. We're hearing reports now that the White House will release its much-anticipated plan for the Middle East peace next month. But apparently, the details of the supposed plan have already made their way to the Knesset, and word is that Team Trump has proposed offering Abu Dis, a suburb of East Jerusalem, as the capital of the future Palestinian state. Al-TV's Brett Allen Smith has more. Uh, Brett, what are your thoughts? Well, look, it's pretty hard to say if this is actually, you know, going to be the deal that's going to be on the table, but the rumors are concrete enough anyway that it's already become a major point of debate in the Knesset. Now, Netanyahu has been pretty quiet so far whether he has actually, you know, been briefed in any, any such deal, but you can be sure that he was at least consulted by the Trump administration as they put this deal together, if they put it together, whatever that ends up being. That's why Netanyahu's chief opposition leader, Yair Lapid, has basically accused Netanyahu of accepting Abu Dhabi as a future Palestinian capital, since Netanyahu probably would have been consulted on a deal point like that. So, I mean, just for argument's sake, let's say that Abu Dhabi is on the table. Mm -hmm. Uh, with this peace plan. Is that an offer that either side would actually even go for? Well, so from the Palestinian side, you know, relations with the U.S. are pretty frozen right now. You know, they just recalled their envoy from Washington last week following the opening of the, opening of the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem. Now, I have heard that Jared Kushner has already started trying to, you know, kind of set the stage for this deal if and when it does arrive next month, which, you know, maybe means Palestinian allies like Egypt and Jordan could be swayed to, to help maybe. But would the Palestinians be open to, to a capital in Abu Dis? I mean, I, I doubt it. I really doubt it. You know, Abu Dis is a pretty far cry from what they, they say they want. A capital that doesn't include Al-Aqsa Mosque, for example, is probably never going to fly with them. Now, as far as Israel goes, it's pretty hard to say. You know, Netanyahu has certainly said again and again that he's willing to accept a fair offer. But then again, most of his coalition partners are extremely against even this idea of a two-state solution. So I doubt that they'll back him in any plan that gives even a small part of Jerusalem to the Palestinians. All right, well, obviously, a lot will depend on the rest of you know, what the deal right. actually says. But Jerusalem is, of course, uh, and has always been sort of the make or break Critical. point with, with uh, past peace offers. Sure. I mean, well, the rumor is that the White House is waiting until the Ramadan holiday ends in mid-June to officially put this plan out there. And obviously, there's a lot of people uh, very anxious to see it, even though some say it may come kind of dead on arrival, a little too late. All right, well, thank you for your report, Brett. Of course. Explosions have just been reported at an Iranian military site in Syria just outside of Damascus. This comes just a few days after another mysterious explosion was reported hitting a Syrian base in the region. A blast that left at least 28 people dead. Speculation is high that Israeli jets may have carried out this morning's attack. But as policy, Israel does not comment on incidents like these. Word is that this morning's attack targeted a base used by Iran to conduct electronic warfare. 
Typically, Syrian media is quick to assign blame for strikes like this, but has so far offered no details. The nature of the attack, conducted in the early hours of the morning, would be more in line with Israel's typical strike pattern. Israel has been very clear that it will not allow an Iranian entrenchment on its doorstep in Syria. Tensions between Iran and Israel reached a fever pitch earlier this month when President Trump withdrew the United States from the JCPOA Iran nuclear deal. Tehran launched no less than 20 missiles at Israeli sites in the Golan shortly thereafter, prompting an Israeli counterattack that severely crippled Tehran's forces in the region. Still, others speculate that these explosions, like Friday's attack, could easily have been committed by Syrian rebels. Some Israeli ministers say the current bout of aggression with Iran is over. Others are keeping a close eye on the border. For decades now, Israeli athletes have faced constant prejudice in sporting events all over the world, particularly in Arab nations where their nation symbols are forbidden to appear. This includes both the Israeli flag and the playing of Israel's national anthem when they win. Well, now Israel is taking this issue to court with a lawsuit, hoping to force Arab countries to give these athletes the same basic freedom as any other athlete in competition. This lawsuit is being assembled by the Israeli Knesset member Yoel Raz Vazov, who also happened to represent Israel in the 2004 Summer Olympics in Judoku. And the legal team already includes some big heavy hitters. Leading the team is none other than famous U.S. lawyer and former Harvard law professor Alan Dershowitz. New York's former Attorney General Dennis Vacco and Attorney John Perzhansky will be backing him up. Israeli athletes have long faced hurdles in global sports arenas. Some Arab countries refuse to even let their athletes compete with Israelis, instead forcing them to forfeit the match. In past years, Israelis have won medals in judo at the United Arab Emirates Grand Slam tournament, but they weren't allowed to have their flag or national anthem present at the award ceremony. Even in the chess world, Israeli chess players were blocked last minute from even flying to Saudi Arabia for last year's World Chess Championship. That's why the legal team feels it's finally time for the rest of the world to show Israel the same fairness it gives every other athlete. According to Dershowitz, there there's no better place to stop this than in sports because the vast majority of spectators and participants do not want to see sports politicized. They don't want to see hatred enter into the sporting arena. Many feel this lawsuit is a long time coming and a tragic necessity to correct a very disturbing trend. Well, you may not want to book your tickets to Israel for the 2019 Eurovision because it looks like the International Song Contest may not actually be held in the country. There are rumors going around that the event is being politicized and may not be held in Jerusalem, even though Israel's Nita Belzilai did take home the big win at this year's Eurovision. Typically, the location of the Eurovision is dictated by the winner from the previous year. In 2017, Portugal won, and in 2018, the Eurovision was held in Portugal. In 2018, Israel won, so the Eurovision is supposed to be held in Israel's capital of Jerusalem in 2019. Well, the Eurovision has just released a tweet advising fans not to go booking their flights just yet because the time and location of the 2019 event has yet to be set. It's not clear if the public statement is suggesting that the Eurovision is reconsidering being held in Israel, but Eurovision spokespeople have declined to provide details on what exactly about the location is in doubt. This is, of course, already causing a stir here in Israel, with Culture Minister Miri Regev and Communications Minister Ayub Kara fighting over which office will be in charge of production if the event even happens. Minister Kara even suggested he would invite Dubai to participate, uh, despite the fact that he doesn't really have the authority to make such a call. The European Broadcasting Authority, which organizes the Eurovision, is apparently very unhappy with the recent remarks by the Israeli minister, so that could be one of the biggest issues here, or bigger issues here. Either way, Israel is still celebrating its big win with superstar Neta Barzilai. The country clearly just was, doesn't want to be a political toy. Get it? All right, just a few days ago, we reported about how the Israeli company Mobileye is test driving its autonomous vehicles in Jerusalem before 8 million of them go to market in 2021. Well, we'd like to think that the future is already here, but let's just say it has some hiccups. One of Mobileye's self-driving cars actually just accidentally ran a red light in Jerusalem. And as can be assumed, the company has a bunch of excuses. The flashy vehicle ran a red light during a test drive last week while a TV crew was inside the car filming the incident. 
That's embarrassing. Mobileye claims a transmitter is put on the car's roof by the TV team had interfered with sensor frequencies and that that's what caused the error. But no matter what the cause, a traffic incident like this could mean that Mobileye still has obstacles to overcome before it can actually market its autonomous vehicles by 2021. Last March, an Uber self-driving car actually hit a woman in the U.S. and killed her. But the co-founder and CEO of Mobileye, Professor Amnon Shashua, was quick to take to the internet to defend the future of autonomous vehicles. He says the woman's tragic death shouldn't be used as an excuse to, quote, stifle important work in the development of self-driving cars. And clearly, accidentally running a red light shouldn't either. And up now, ILTV's Emmanuel Kadosh is here with this week's Top 5. Israel is known around the world as the startup nation, but high tech and startups are not our only area of expertise. We absolutely kill it when it comes to TV. So I'm here to give you guys the top five Israeli TV shows that you can actually binge on Netflix. Number one on our list, you probably have already heard of the series Fauda, which actually means chaotic in Arabic. Fauda is focused on an intense, captivating, and fast-moving cover IDF unit on their hunt to capture a prominent Hamas terrorist. Now, I don't want to give too much away, but season two has already aired, and I'm just saying you're missing out if you haven't already binged both seasons. Number two on our list is the show Hostages, which is considered to be both a political thriller as well as a family drama. The show focuses on a surgeon meant to operate on the Israeli prime minister when last minute her family is taken hostage. This is definitely a highly entertaining and eyes glued to the screen type show, so I'd get going to watch it if I were you. Third up is one of my personal favorites, Mossad 101. Now, this isn't just my favorite because I was low-key meant to be a Mossad agent, but because the show is quirky, entertaining, and over-the-top thrilling. The show focuses on a fictional and unorthodox training course for Mossad agents. Listen, if you're looking for an action-packed drama with some Israeli humor here and there, Mossad 101 is definitely for you. Fourth on our list is the series The Gordon Cell. This show revolves around a married couple who were once former Soviet Union spies that later run into trouble with a Russian intelligence officer that later shows up at their home in an attempt to, to recruit their son, who, may I add, is a decorated Israeli Air Force soldier. Now, can't say any more or you will probably miss work next week watching it. Last, but as you already know, most definitely not least, is the series Sulgim, which means knitted in Hebrew. The show revolves around the love lives of four modern Orthodox Jews in Jerusalem and provides a sort of intimate look into the experiences of a religious yet modern Jew in the Israeli society. Definitely worth a watch to get a different point of view. That's all for today's Top 5. Back to you. That's it for this week's Roundup. Tune in next Friday for our next episode of This Week in Israel. I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for joining us from Tel Aviv.